Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining me this morning. Uh, I'm just going to talk to you very briefly about some research I'll be presenting at an AGU session later on today, where we've generated some updated flood risk estimates for the contemporary United States. And during this analysis, we found that if you use FEMA flood maps to estimate these quantities, you end up with an underestimate of about threefold. Um, when we used our flood maps to generate flood risk estimates, we found that about 40 million people are living on the one in 100 year floodplain in the United States. And if we did the exact same analysis with FEMA flood maps, uh, you, you come to about 13 million. Now this is because the FEMA flood maps are incomplete. They only cover, in, in terms of the US land area, about 60% of it. And even within these areas that are covered, they tend to just focus on the primary large streams within those catchments. And it, I mean, it's quite a spatially variable picture across the country, but they will tend to have, have not modeled uh, the, the smaller headwater tributaries. And cumulatively, when you add those up across the country, that's a lot of hazard and risk that, th that is therefore missed. So it's for that reason that, that these numbers are so different. Um, and, and when we, we've also got hold of some, some very detailed uh, population projections from the US Environmental Protection Agency. It's their ICLUS scenarios project. And we've intersected that data with our floodplain maps. Uh, and, and so we can look at what flood risk might look like throughout the 21st century. Uh, just to give you some, some visual aid as to what this kind of analysis looks like, the, the blue here is our model showing what the one in a hundred year floodplain is, and that is the land area that has a 1% chance of being inundated in any given year. Uh, and the grayscale on this map is present day developments, uh, where the, the lighter colors are less intense developments, the darker colors are the more intense developments. I've just, I've just picked this area near Kansas City. Uh, and, and we can see that, that where the blue is intersected with the grayscale, that is where we're generating risk currently. And as we move up this example in 2050, the red areas there are the new developments up to that date. Uh, and our analysis has found that you know, a, lot of this, a lot of this land that's available for development is in hazard zones, and that is where the EPA is projecting a, a, lot, of, um, a lot of the developments to be, to be built. Uh, in the present day, we have about 40 million people on the floodplain, as I've said, and as we move up to 2050, this is expected to rise just based on development alone to about 60 million. Up to 2100, we're almost touching 75 million. Now, we're not even accounting for what climate change may do to flooding. We're simply looking at the intensification of floodplain development. And due to that alone, we see that risk is increasing quite dramatically. Uh, now, this has been a collaborative work but that has spanned across the scientific sector. We've had contributions from the academic world, the University of Bristol, the commercial world, a company called Fathom, the Nature Conservancy in the charitable sector, and also the US Environmental Protection Agency in the governance world. We've had scientists contributing to this analysis from all those sectors. Um, and if you would like some more information, I've got some copies of the paper that's currently under review in environmental research letters or you can get in touch with me on that email. Thank you. All right, uh, my name's Michelle Hummel. Uh, as mentioned, I'm from UC Berkeley, and my team is working on quantifying the vulnerability of wastewater infrastructure here in the United States to flooding from sea level rise. And so just to give a little bit of background on this issue, um, historically wastewater treatment plants have been located at very low elevations near coastlines, and that's for two main reasons. The first is to allow sewage from homes and businesses to be conveyed to these plants via gravity as much as possible, which helps to reduce pumping costs and conveyance costs. And then the second reason is that once this water is treated, it can be easily discharged to neighboring waterways and that minimizes costs as well. So this has been very effective in terms of keeping costs low. Um, as you can see, the two uh, wastewater treatment plants there near the coastline. 
However, this has also made plants very susceptible to flooding. And primarily in the past, this has been due to storms like hurricanes and other uh, large storm events. And this is a major issue because if these plants become flooded, um, flooding can lead to the release of untreated sewage into our waterways, which can pose a threat to human health and to the environment. So this has already been an issue and sea level rise um, will only exacerbate this issue and potentially affect even more people. So we wanna understand what is the magnitude of that threat. And so we looked at this at a national level across the United States. Um, this map is showing the coastal states and each blue dot represents a wastewater treatment plant that's vulnerable to flooding from one to six feet of sea level rise. So you can see that vulnerability is spread throughout the coastal US. There's not just a single region that's vulnerable, but really almost all of the states along the coast have some level of vulnerability to sea level rise. And then we also zoomed in on a few states here. So this table is showing the number of residents in these states who would lose access to wastewater treatment services for uh, various sea level rise scenarios from one foot of sea level rise to six feet of sea level rise. And so a few things uh, to take away from this. So some states have very immediate vulnerability. Uh, California, New Jersey, and Virginia all have over 500,000 residents who could lose access to wastewater services after only one foot of sea level rise. And so these states really need to think about incorporating adaptation planning into their um, investment efforts as soon as possible. Other states like New York and Florida don't have as much immediate vulnerability, but you can see that they do have large populations at risk um, a little bit later on. So after three or four feet of sea level rise, each of these states has over a million people at risk. And then as we look towards six feet, there's really widespread vulnerability across um, all five of these states. So while New York and Florida have more time to plan, they still do need to be thinking about adaptation um, as well. So by doing this analysis at the national level, we can get an idea of how these risks progress over time, which allows for us to prioritize investments, hopefully in the areas where the risk is most immediate and then um, kind of plan how to progress that over time. <clears throat> we also wanted to get an idea of how the magnitude of these risks compares to other studies that have been done. So <clears throat> we were comparing our estimates of the number of people who would lose access to wastewater services with previous estimates from Howard et al. of the number of people who would experience flooding of their homes and residents, so people who are actually living within the flooded zone. And you can see that for three feet of sea level rise, about two million people are living in the flood zone and would have damage to their properties. But um, over four times as many people, so 8.4 million people, would experience a loss of wastewater services, which would also have significant impacts on um, their livelihoods as well. And then looking at six feet, with a similar analysis, about six million people would be located in the flood zone but 27.8 million people could lose wastewater services. So you can see that the service disruptions due to flooding of wastewater infrastructure could be very widespread, affecting nearly four times as many people as previous estimates of direct flooding. And this just goes to show that the impacts of sea level rise are not contained just to the flood zone or just to the near coastal zone. They're also, um, spread out throughout coastal communities. So because these infrastructure networks provide connections between the coastal zone and the rest of the community, um, a disruption at the wastewater plant could cascade throughout the system and really affect many more people in these coastal zones. Uh, so just to summarize the two main points here, uh, timing is really important for understanding how we want to adapt to sea level rise. Um, so that way we can prioritize the limited amount of funding that's available in the plants that have the most immediate vulnerability and then um, come up with a plan to adapt over time um, as sea level rise progresses. And then, as I mentioned, impacts really do extend beyond the flooded zone. So even residents who might live what they consider to be a safe distance from the coastline and don't experience direct flooding, they'll still be um, inconvenienced and potentially experience um, severe risks due to disruptions to wastewater infrastructure. Uh, so if you have any 
other questions or want to get in touch, my contact information is right there. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. Um, and Nicholas uh, is on the phone. Um, Nicholas, um, if you can hear us, um, if you could, you could start your presentation. Good morning. Uh, can you hear me okay at that end? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, I'm getting a bit of a... Sorry that I couldn't be... I have a final afternoon. Judy does call. I've... Uh, this will work. Oh, Nicholas, um, we're having a little trouble hearing you. Maybe you could start over. I'm going to try it this way. Again, I'm getting a big echo in that end. What I'd like to do is introduce you to a relatively new area for research related policy called managed retreat. Sea level rise, extreme weather, and flooding along the world's rivers and coastlines threaten communities particularly small towns that lack the resources to invest in large flood control infrastructure. Looking towards a climate change future, some of these towns will inevitably need to relocate permanently. He does call. I'm serving today in two capacities. First is convener of one of AGU's keynote or union sessions entitled Managed, Manage, sorry, Mitigating Flood Risk and Climate Change Impacts Through Managed Retreat. That session is scheduled for Wednesday morning. That's 8 till 10 in the morning in Hall E2. Second, I've been asked to summarize some of my own group's research and recent results in the area of managed retreat. Extreme weather and flooding along the world's rivers. Rivers and coastal flooding remain the costliest natural hazard worldwide. Spiraling losses are driven by growing human populations, expanding infrastructure, and climate change. Now, Among his last acts in office, former President Obama instructed 11 federal agencies to develop a framework for, quote, managed retreat. In this case, meaning a policy for relocating entire towns threatened by climate-driven flooding and rising sea levels. At the Wednesday union session, you'll hear from researchers at Tulane University and leaders from the state of Louisiana and local groups involved in managed retreat in the Mississippi Delta. In particular, they'll talk about the relocation of the town of Ile de Jean Charles. You'll also hear from Joe Tyrone, who's a grassroots leader of Oakwood Beach in Staten Island, a community catastrophically flooded during Hurricane Sandy that elected to relocate rather than build in place and relocate against the wishes of their elected leaders in order to create coastal wetland buffer to protect against future storms. You'll also meet Paul Osman floodplain manager for the state of Illinois, who has doggedly pursued floodplain buyouts and mitigation over the past 30 years, making Illinois, well, if not exactly resilient to flooding, at least one of the few states pointed in the right direction. Who you won't meet on Wednesday is anyone from Kivalina or Newtalk or the other eight or so Native American villages in Alaska that are seeking relocations today. Uh, these are among the most pressing cases for managed retreat in the U.S. today, but we were unable to bring any of them down from north of the Arctic Circle. Now on quickly to my own group's research. It turns out that managed retreat is not a new solution. Over the past 150 years or so, about a dozen U.S. towns have responded to flooding by moving themselves entirely or almost entirely off the floodplains and flood-affected coastlines. Some of you may have heard of Valmire, Illinois. Perhaps some of you heard of uh, Soldiers Grove, Wisconsin. But probably not, for example, Pattonsburg, Missouri, which after relocating off the floodplain went out in a blaze of glory as the set of an early Civil War film. Or but have you heard about Nebraska? Nebraska. No, sorry, it's Niobrara, Nebraska, which has moved twice because the first relocation didn't take the town fully out of harm's way. Not and I'll bet good money you've never heard of Odenau, Wisconsin, a Native American town along the Fox okay. River that, if the patchy records are correct, may have been the largest flood-related relocation in U.S. history. But the full set of these wholesale relocations provide important lessons for climate adaptation in the future. Our I'm team conducted I'm interviews, a large regional survey, analyzed the hydrology and topography and other geospatial characteristics of these floodplain communities, and completed a geostatistical model of relocation opportunities. 
Interviews and survey results documented patterns of community vulnerability and impediments to mitigation and relocation. Our geostatistical tool, which is a logistical regression model implemented in the GIS environment, was used to identify the factors that leaders of past relocations used to select the sites of their new towns. We plan to develop this model as a software tool to help communities considering managed retreat relocations now and in the future. In conclusion, managed retreat will never serve as a universal solution to global flood risk and climate change. Large cities just can't be moved, and smaller towns sometimes lack viable relocation options. However, managed retreat relocations can be a viable, cost-effective, and culturally sensitive solutions for some rural communities that suffer from repeated and debilitating coastal or river flooding. Thank you. Statistical regression model implemented in the GIS environment was used to identify the factors that leaders of past relocations use. Okay, thank you. Hello, uh, so long with the uh, native, native speakers and with a nice accent. Um, so I'm going to talk about projections of extreme sea levels in view of climate change. I work at the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. So we are, let's say that the Institute is like the scientific consultant of the European Commission. We do policy support research. Um, and we are talking about uh, coastal impacts. So and when, when we talk about the challenges for the coast, is that we have from one side, we have uh, a increased population density, and which has been increasing dramatically in the, in the recent years. And uh, most of this development it is taking place near the coast. So during the past century, we experienced a rise in, in coastal risks, but it was mostly driven because of socioeconomic development. At the same time, on the left side of my slide, you can see that the, um, the sea levels have been increasing, and, uh, and this increase has been with an accelerated rate. And this you can see in the top uh, left panel. And uh, the same accelerated uh, rise of sea level, uh, we can see it also in the projections from the climate models. So we have, uh, from one side, the, continu the continuing trend of uh, rising population and rising socioeconomic development of the coast. At the same time, we have uh, the projections of rising seas, which is something that we haven't experienced so far in, in, the, in the extent that it's projected. Uh, so this slide uh, summarizes what we are doing there in the Joint Research Center in our coastal group. Uh, and what I'm going to present, so uh, most of the studies that are related to, to coastal uh, risks, they focus on sea level rise. They take uh, projections of sea level rise and then they do impact modeling, etc. Uh, what we try to do there is we try to go a step forward and uh, assess all the components that drive extreme sea levels. So you have on the left, uh, you have these global maps. It's, we have sea level rise projections. In the middle, we do also wave modeling. So we run dynamic simulations of waves and we see how the waves will change in the future. We do the same for the storm surge, how the storm surge will, will change. We consider also tropical cyclones. And we also run simulations of tides, considering the range of projected uh, sea level rise. Uh, this is what I'm going to talk today. Uh, we, we go even further. We do inundation modeling, and we, and we also assess coastal impacts, because in Brussels, they, what they want for us, basically, is to provide them uh, projections of, of risks in monetary values or number of people affected, etc. Um, so we all know that uh, the extreme sea levels are going to rise, and uh, what we see in the top left panel is what is the base, the present day 100-year event along the world. Uh, the two slides uh, they show us what is the projected change. Uh, under a, a moderate uh, mitigation, CO2 emission mitigation scenario, or under a business as usual scenario, RCP 8.5. And uh, these values are uh, by the year 2100. So you see that we have an increase in the 100 year event, which uh, ranges from 25 centimeters, but it can exceed one and a half meter. And uh, this is already a significant rise. If we convert it into return periods, what we see is that basically the, a large part of the tropics by the year 2050 will be exposed to the present day 100 year event every year. 
And uh, this is quite important because uh, this is an area that is, uh, that is not so rich and doesn't have a high capacity to adapt. Uh, similarly, areas like the Mediterranean Sea will increase the tenfold increase in the frequency of extreme events by, by 2050. And again, the Mediterranean Sea is let's, it's the, um, it's the poorest part of Europe and uh, suffering uh, many countries are under recession. So there are, there are serious uh, repercussions. Um, now, it's clear that all this uh, will, will result in, in impacts and, um, and I would like to make the point that it doesn't matter if somebody believes in anthropogenic climate change or, or weather variability or whatever how you call it. Uh, we have seen the, the right graph shows us that um, how the temperature has been rising and we are arriving to the point that we will uh, of one, one and a half degree warming uh, compared to pre-industrial times. And uh, as the temperature is rising, the seas are going to rise also. And this is because of the, not because the scientists say so, but it's because of the thermodynamic properties of the water. So the water absorbs 90% of the increased energy that comes from the atmosphere. And uh, when the water gets warm, it expands. And it expands not linearly, but it expands exponentially with, um, with temperature. Uh, we also know from geological records but that uh, hundreds of thousands of years ago, the, the Earth was, was a one and a half degree warmer or two degrees warmer compared to pre-industrial times and the sea levels were six to ten meters. So this is something that is going to come uh, eventually and, um, and it's going to drive uh, increased impacts. Um, so also uh, in, our, uh, in our institute we have different groups that work in different uh, natural hazards and uh, all the projections show that okay we will have changes in climates will we, which will change uh, the dynamics of the, of the weather and the, we have differences in the pattern of impact. But um, this means that, as we see also from our projections, in some places the waves become bigger, in some uh, places the, the waves become smaller. But uh, the unique t thing about the, um, the coastal risks is that we have sea level rise which is an additional magnification factor. And uh, for example, we see that uh, for Europe, the direct impacts from coastal flooding uh, for river floods is at the moment 0.04% of the GDP and coastal floods are much less significant, it's 0.01% uh, of GDP. But if we do our simulations and we do the projections, uh, for the future uh, the impacts from coastal flooding become 0.1% of GDP but uh, coastal floods can be, can, can be eight times higher. So. Uh, Coastal flooding becomes one of the most important natural hazards in the future. And uh, it's not that it's the end of the world. There are technical solutions. We can adapt also the previous presentation uh, was about this topic. But uh, for example, the Dutch, they are living below sea level now for, uh, for many years. Uh, the question is that this is gonna, this is gonna lead into, into changes of, of lifestyle. For example, we have to go from this situation on the left to this situation on the right if we decide to protect the coast. Uh, and this will, will come with increased cost and uh, it will have political, economic and environmental also implications, as well as, well as social justice issues. And uh, to close my presentation, for example, if you do a simple calculation, I make a comparison. We have Jamaica, we have the Netherlands. We, we consider both countries' coastline, both countries' GDP, and uh, we see how much the Netherlands are, are, are spending to protect their coast. And this is around 0.23% of GDP with a rough calculation. Uh, if Jamaica needs to do the same, they have to spend 5% of GDP. And this is uh, immediately an obvious uh, issue. So that was the end uh, of my presentation. Um, all the data we produce, they are publicly available uh, in, the, in the link uh, that you see there. And uh, also you can find contact information in my personal website uh, below. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll now take questions from reporters in the room. If you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand and state your name and affiliation. Are there any questions from reporters in the room? 
No, are there any questions on the chat? Yeah, we have uh, one question from Kathy Ann Kowalski. Uh, this is for Nicholas Pinter. Uh, she asks, how do you set priorities for managed retreats? And she goes on to elaborate. For example, yeah. for example, in New Talk, Alaska, they have had trouble getting funding from FEMA, and it seems there will be more and more communities in trouble. Even in New York, there is still a backlog of people needing money after Superstorm Stan Super Sandy to either move or rebuild. So where do you draw the line over whose communities get to move and retain their cultural, cultural identity slash senior family and friends, and which ones are split up? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. And again, if someone could address that echo, that would be great. So how you prioritize these managed retreat projects is a huge challenge, and it is a social and political one, not really a scientific one. So the first step is obviously to do a cost-benefit analysis, as FEMA does, before contributing funds to any of these. And again, in some cases, they are cost-effective. In other cases, it's not a viable solution for large communities. Uh, the Alaskan villages have struggled with the same challenges that all communities that have either implemented or, or contemplated managed retreat have. That is the cost and enormous social challenges. Yes. Um, and again, if someone could address that actor, that would be great. So how you prioritize these managed retreat projects is a huge challenge, and it is a social and political one, not really a scientific one. So the first step is obviously to do a cost-benefit analysis, as FEMA does, for contributing funds to any of these. And again, in some cases, they are cost-effective. In other cases, it's not a viable solution for large the Alaskan villages have struggled with the same challenges that all communities that have either implemented or, come, or contemplated managed retreat have. That is the cost and enormous relief to budget. Again, if someone could address that actor, that would be great. So, how you prioritize these managed retreat projects is a huge challenge, and it is a social and political one, not really a scientific one. So the first step is obviously to do a cost-benefit analysis as we that done for contributing funds to Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think we have a little bit of technical difficulties. I think it's uh, coming through the web stream. But um, hopefully, um, the reporter could also we'll, we'll give the reporter um, his in contact information. She can follow up with Nicholas uh, separately. Are there any other questions um, in the room? Uh, Mark Schlefstein, uh, Time Speaking in here in New Orleans. Uh, Oliver, for um, your study, uh, are there uh, going to be efforts to get FEMA to change the way that it's looking at floodplains? Uh, uh, are they looking at your data and trying to figure out what to do about it? Do I just push this? Well, not that I'm aware of, but we'd be very happy to work with FEMA if, if they approached us. Now, the, the way that we generated these estimates is using cutting-edge methodology that has only really come to the fore in the past couple of years just with the availability of big data and the advances in computational capacity that allows us to generate flood maps on this scale. Now, FEMA has been working on flood map generation for three decades or more, so they actually haven't had the opportunity to utilize this kind of methodology. Now, far be it from me as a British PhD student to tell the Americans how to handle flood policy, but I'd be very surprised if within the next five years this isn't a methodology that FEMA will be adopting. Are there any other questions from reporters in the room? Thanks. Um, this from Michelle, just curious, are you aware of a wastewater treatment plants in the U.S. that are taking steps to prepare for sea level rise at this point? Yeah, so um, I'm working in the San Francisco Bay Area, so there are a number of plants who have uh, started looking into adaptation options. Um, primarily, the major considerations have been uh, seawalls, although some wastewater treatment plants have started to look at uh, more nature-based solutions to 
provide some coastal protection. Um, but some other issues that aren't considered as much are uh, the groundwater flooding that results from sea level rise. So um, that has gotten less attention. Um, I talk a little bit more about that with my poster presentation this afternoon, um, if you want to hear more. But there are steps being taken, um, but it kind of varies based on the plant. Um, some haven't even started planning. Others have started pilot projects. Um, so it's highly variable, but hopefully this sort of research will um, encourage a broader discussion about adaptation and how to protect our wastewater infrastructure. Uh, Harvey Leifert, Freelance. Uh, just to follow up, do you happen to know, do you happen to know offhand the number of your posters so we can go right to it without searching? Uh, sure, it's the global environmental change uh, I think the number is 0819 this afternoon. Excellent. Um, are there any other questions from reporters in the room? Are there any other questions on the chat? No? Okay, great. Well, thank you. That concludes our press conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up at 1130 is the eclipse. <laughs>